can solve something and you have a problem and then you have a solution and that's it. There's smart enough people who can do something and fix it. That's just not true. This methodology is called design thinking. Design thinking works a lot on a research. So you basically try to get as close to reality and observe it and ask the right questions to understand the problem space as you can. Hello and welcome to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I'm Will Polston. This is episode number 160. And in this episode, I'm joined by Marcus Kirsch. Marcus is a dot-com veteran, author and thought leader for innovation and wicked problems. He is a Royal College of Art alumni and has led innovation and transformation efforts for clients like AstraZeneca, BT, GSK, the Natural History Museum, Science Museum London, NHS, Nissan, HSBC, just to name a few. In the Wicked podcast, he has talked to over 100 global thought leaders such as Tom Peters, Doug Powell and Elvin Turner from organisations such as Deloitte, McKinsey, the US Navy, IBM, London School of Economics, Twitter, Fortune Magazine and many more by reading a book a week for over two years and then talking to the authors. He helps organisations and leaders shape processes and teams. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about Wicked Problems. So Marcus, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Problems. I think most people in their their life have said that they have had a problem or two at some stage. I'm sure there's many <laughs> people that have got many problems going on right now. And those problems span a whole range of different areas of life. And, uh, and, and there's big problems and there's small problems. But I, I can't imagine that there's that many people that will say, right now, I have a wicked problem in my life. And I actually first come across the term wicked problem with you. And uh, when I came across the the wicked podcast and the wicked company, which is the, the name of the book that you've authored. So let, let's just start by explaining to people that are listening that have maybe never heard of wicked problems. What, what a wicked problem is. Let's start. Let's start with that. Yes, uh, thank you. So yes, wicked problem. Uh, for a long, long time, being a very niche idea and a label for how we deal with problems. The term comes from, um, I think it's around 1950s, 60s. Uh, a professor over in Germany, Heidelberg, came up with the idea of wicked problems. The name was given to the type of things where he looked at so Horst Rittel, he looked at urban planning, which is generally a very highly complex area to look at. Urban planning, how to you know build cities, design cities to become better and more efficient. And he realized somehow historically science and engineering is really seems to struggle with building and designing stuff and ideas and solutions for urban planning that actually work. Because there's so many unpredictability factors in it. Even when you put things in place, it keeps evolving. And by the time you're putting it there, it's different again. And it's just hyper complicated. And he identified one or two characteristics that are inherently different to other complex problems. You know, complex problems being like building a massive bridge, building uh, an airplane, which made out of I think typically Apple is made out of like 400,000 or something items so it's complex but you build an airplane it's going to fly or you build a bridge like Golden Gate Bridge and it will work and it would hold up as much as they're complex they're still tame problems because you can do that you take the bridge put it somewhere else it will still work as a bridge you can take the plane put it somewhere else it will still fly Wicked problems are where you have a lot of people involved and dynamics like crime, poverty, epidemics, where when they start evolving and then you throw a solution at it, um, the problem will evolve around it and will change. So by the time the solution is valid and growth, the problem has evolved which makes it really, really hard to ever understand the full problem to its fullest and to ever have a solution that's just a perfect solution and then you have to, can walk away and it's done, like with a bridge and plane. So you identified it as a label and said, these are different, but science and engineering is really bad at it. What 
methodology can we add to it or can we evolve that helps us there and that's how it starts so that's where wicked problems are coming from and the the the, the, the identification of like we need a new approach to this because i think the way we're doing things have companies and organizations solve stuff is not good enough anymore. So that's the origin of wicked problems. Yeah. So so my kind of understanding of it is that that it's a a, a problem that when you take action towards solving it, other problems are created. So it feels like it's like a never ending problem almost. You know, it's that that's kind yeah. of my really really loose understanding of it and re- the reason i think this and i was so keen to have you on the podcast here is because for, for many of the listeners they'll know i i really specialize in working with individuals mm-hmm. and individuals and, and looking at life and all the different dynamics of life and one of the cliches that most people are looking for in their life is life balance you know whatever balance mm-hmm. is and the irony is is that like i'll take a really simple thing is that someone's like, right i want to make more money so I want to make more money. And in order to make more money, I need, in, they might think initially, I need to work more. So they work more. But then what that does is then that creates an issue and creates tension in their relationships because they're not around as much. They're not spending as much quality yeah. time in their family. So all of a sudden it's manifested into something else. And that's that's where I think it's it's really quite interesting. I know that you've worked and, and done a huge amount of your work is in sort of more of the the corporate world and transformational organ, uh, organizational change at a transformational level with i mean you'll you'll name drop some of the companies my, my, my big and i but, but the, the likes of the bps and some of these really large large organizations um i can't remember off the top of my head but i remember reading them about that that you've got quite a quite a uh um uh, an impressive selection of these types of companies that you work that you've worked with and and, and consulted with but it's a bit like sliding doors, isn't it? You know, one door opens, another one closes, and it's in this this whole piece. And they're sort of multifaceted. But does that make them impossible to ever solve? Or do you think that they can be solved, but it's just understanding the mindset around? Because it, it, I'm right in saying that the concept of wicked problems is very much mindset-led. Yes. So I would say, so two things. So you mentioned mindset and you mentioned like, if are they ever solved? So by definition, you could also ask, is life ever solved? Like, you you know, you live your life, you go through different phases, you learn different things. You're just, you know, you're born into a family, you become yourself, you build your own family, you have a job, kids, keeps evolving you know and in the end your kids move away and then you have the later part of your life it's a bit more like that it's ever evolving everything you do will affect other things as you said you know like oh i want to have a career i want to make more money well it gives me potentially maybe less time with my family it causes issues there so you know nothing exists in a vacuum everything affects anything else i think one of the other principles that's similar to it is like the soci- sociologist dilemma. As I said, we saw the principle where the second you observe something, it will change. Mm. You know, it will do that. Quantum mechanics is the same thing. The second I look at, you know, like a particle, it will move because nothing is untouched. So it, even on a scientific level, it's it's recognized that everything is sort of dependent on something else. In life, we know this. We know this also with our children, you know, you you, you kind of uh, tell your children, you give them guidelines, and then they just have their own ideas, you know, and you tell them one thing, and they walk around it, you know, and it's the same thing. So oddly enough, we're all familiar with one. The first one is like your own life. That's the biggest wicked problem you're ever gonna be involved in, your own life, how it evolves and how you do things, how you react to things. Um, so we always had it around us. I think the tricky thing is that it's often not identified as such because a lot of our economy and society for, let's say, the last 100 years has been evolved around industrial revolution, which is mass production. No, no, no. You can solve something and you have a 
problem, then you have a solution, and that's it. There's smart enough people who can do something and fix it. That's just not true. Um, and it's a very different narrative to go into and say, yeah, some things will never be fully solved. We'll have to continuously deal with it, like crime. We will never solve crime. There will always be some people popping up who do stuff that challenge society and do things that we don't agree with. Um, all we can do, we cannot solve it, but all we can do is like make it better, bring it down as low as possible so that we improve our current state. So yes, there's never a solution. We can only elevate where we are and how we deal with it to a better level. And we need to accept that. So would you I say that, that's, that's a common difference? Mm. Would you say that's that that's common across every wicked problem? Is it's never solvable, but it but they are always improvable. Yes. So they're always potentially improvable. And to get even more detail on that one, because that makes them wicked and really complex and complicated, is that when you introduce a solution, you have to accept the fact that you will improve some aspects, but some of it will potentially make things worse. To, to, to give you maybe more practical example, because I know it's very theoretical. Um, cars, right? So make every car not run on gas. Great. So you don't have the oil anymore. We don't have it in the city or whatever and the exhaust of it. So you introduce electric vehicles. Great. But then you have the batteries. The batteries have their chemicals and the acids in it and whatever. And you have to deal with that. So the electric vehicles, as much as they solve that part, they will create another issue on another level in another space. So that's one simple example to think about where you go, this is great. It solves that really well. But then, yeah, but look at this. Now you have to, what are you going to deal with batteries when they get old and, you know, the acids in and all that stuff and the chemicals in them? How do you going to do that now? So now you have to further mm -hmm. it out and solve it over there because the problem just has changed. That's maybe a nice little simple example of, yeah, it's never perfect. Yeah. There will be other things. And, and I think that, I mean, we said about mindset as well. I think that's so relevant in life in general in the if we strive if we're deluded enough and this is this is important if we're deluded enough to think that there is a, a one-sided ideal so that there's only positive and negative and never any negative then we're deluding ourselves you know every action yeah. has an equal reaction and it's understanding that and and, and embracing that but i suppose is is the idea of un, or, or attempting to understand wicked problems having hindsight of what those reactions are going to be before they happen? Is that a, a lot of the the work that you're doing when you're working with these organisations? Is to to basically use foresight to see these potential issues before they arise? Yeah, so that's a really good point. So foresight, and you know, let's if we keep that. If you, if you describe it in a more simple way, it's like, can you predict the future? Can you be smart mm. enough to predict the future or the next step? And the simple answer is no, you can't. These things are system levels. They're, they're um, exponential. You will not be able to predict. It's just not. There's a whole thing uh, that is, um, th there's a law about that, that it's called Ashby's law of systems, which basically says the system in itself because it keeps changing and it keeps evolving around it, will throw variants at you. You know, it evolves, it does different things. The different things are the variants. So if you want to ever tackle a system and make improve it and shift it in a particular way, you have to throw more variants at it than it throws at you. Otherwise, it's going to run over you and then you have no chance. Mm -hmm. And this dynamic of it does stuff, you want to do stuff to it, is exactly that. The variance, uh, the approach is essentially is, I want to do a hundred small things and try it at the system, try it at the situation for one or two to stick and improve it in a positive way. The rest I discard and then I try another hundred things. So it never stops. It keeps evolving like that. It's not, I cannot predict this. I cannot tell which of the hundred things 
will succeed. I cannot map it on a plan and go like, oh yeah, I'm smart. So out of these hundred ideas I have, those two would definitely kind of work. That is just not working anymore. There's no specialist in the world who can predict mm. how these things react and the solutions will have an impact. So therefore, the strategy is that I will be able to test a hundred things and I will quickly identify based on the testing what I measure that those are the two things that are going to keep me as I say on this card and I know this is going to level up and then I can't do the same again. Yeah. So you cannot predict. All you can do is try and test, experiment the hell out of it to stay on top. That's yeah. the approach. Yeah, I get it. So w- what about from a, a really practical perspective you know, I, I know wicked problems that there, there's things that are linked to them in terms of um, prioritization, becoming more efficient and more effective. So some really practical yeah. things. So the people that are listening to this are thinking, okay, well, I can see maybe where I've got a wicked problem in my life. How do they even attempt uh, prioritizing what they're working towards and ensuring they stay efficient and effective whilst they're working on solving these challenges, understanding that it's quite a holistic piece of work that they're, yeah. that they're doing? So, um, I mean, one of the approaches, so one of the approaches to solve these kind of things, and uh, from my perspective, and I was a bit biased, there were like one of these methodologies called design thinking. Design thinking works a lot on a research. So you basically try to get as close to reality and observe it and ask the right questions to understand the problem space as you can. The second is then as a, as a simple um, prioritization model is DVF, so desirability, viability, feasibility. So which sorry, you can apply again, desi- desirability? Sorry, yeah. Desirability, viability, and feasibility. Right. And this works both in companies and in your life. And the DVF, those three aspects, are essentially desirability is how does your solution affect or is beneficial to the end user? So if you look at a pandemic, like how much if you throw out um uh, solution, tablets, maybe medication to a pandemic, how much, how much does that solve? Or, you know, like customers, if I create a product and they use it, how much does it solve my problem? Viability is usually the business case. It's either you or a company is like, okay, how much does it benefit me? The one thing is I'm throwing it out there. The second is, how does it benefit me? I make an effort. How much am I growing and make money and all this stuff to it? Viability. Feasibility is what do I need to make this happen? If I have an you know an app like Uber who solves me being able to call a cab, have a cab ride and arrive at my destination, that's a solution. Um, what does it take for me to create that? Do I have developers, do I have technology? Uh, these days, you know, do I need to buy an AI system? Do I need to create hardware? Something like that. So how much does it take investment and effort to do that? And good solutions have a really nice balance between that. It means customer benefits, I can do it, and the business makes some money. If you have the wrong balance, like the business makes a lot of money, but the customer doesn't get a lot of value, then the customer is not going to buy it. Mm. And then in turn, the business is not going to make money. Yeah. If you have something where the feasibility is like, we have to buy this new system and cost us a hundred million. Well, that's going to make the product so expensive that we can't solve it. We can't make it happen. That's not viable either. Or if it's just for the customer, like I make everything happen for the customer, but the business is not going to make any money, then the business is not going to be successful. Mm. So you want to find a balance between these three. And normally, if you find a really good balance between those, you'll probably have a really good solution on your hands that likely will elevate the situation. Yeah. So that's the prioritization. So you, you test it on these different levels. Try to find a balance, and that will probably get you on the right track to identify something that's of value across the board. Sounds, sounds good. So from a, a really practical perspective, a lot of people that listen to this, they run their own business, small businesses, smaller businesses, you know, then they're, they're not sort of running sort of bit, they don't own or run sort of necessarily large corporates 
what yeah. is but if somebody perceives that they have a wicked problem in their life or business right now what are the really practical things that they could be working on to ensure that they can be working on it in a way that is deemed to be positive because it's all well and good saying well if these if these problems evolve as you solve them it's like well what's the point in even attempting you know there could almost be like this um sort of helpless hopeless mindset yeah. towards them it's like well what's the point in even giving it a go so what what are the really practical things that people could be doing to make some form of positive headwind if they've got one of these challenges right now yeah so yeah i, I know it sounds daunting and a bit dark and a bit scary like because it's like cutting off the heads of a hydra and we might not have two more but if you look at it, we've done this for a long time. It's not like it's a new thing, right? So the market and businesses, businesses exist in a market. The market changes all the time. New trends, new products, new technologies, and new you know, competition. It's always been a thing. This is not new. It's just the way you approach it and the way we might be able to solve it is different with understanding the problems. Um, you know, if you look at things like the internet happening, it's like, okay, so we now have a new piece of tech. And before you know it, suddenly people, companies have to adopt digital in the right way. And it's complex and what part to invest in, how big's your IT system, blah, 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 blah. We've done this before. I think we just didn't look at it from a complex systemic perspective. We looked at it from a manufacturing mass production level. And I think it's really a little bit failing. Um, what we can do is this. And I think in the most simplest terms is that try to be as close to reality as possible. And by that, I mean, test it, ask people, look at what's going on. And the, 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 the challenge, and I think where a lot of organizations have been failing, especially if they're bigger, is that they're so big, they develop these abstractions of how reality looks like. You know, they have the processes, the models, their numbers, and the numbers are arbitrary. It's like, oh yeah, we have, you know, we have, uh, HR talent level on six and capabilities and da, 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 da. and before you know it when they get bigger and I'm, as you said you know I, I work with a lot of big companies they just suddenly look at the numbers they don't look at the people they don't look at reality and like what's happening in the shops what's what's the story in the shops like oh no we have 100 shops and they all run on 30 what does that mean it's like really abstract mm -hmm. and if you don't get close enough to reality and you measure differently and you look a bit closer, you'll lose because you'll not understand the problem. The numbers will not tell the story of what's really going on and you're losing. So tackling with the problems is stepping into that measurement space, making the effort to be closer to reality rather than being abstract and removed from it. And then you have a fighting chance, which often Again, it's also not necessarily new. There's, there's, there's a lot of things over back in the 80s and 90s where people said, you know, CEOs, what should CEOs do? You, know, you should step down onto the factory floor and talk to your workers. You should go out, Starbucks, go into the branches and have a look how they're working. Is there any issue there? Is there any problem there? You know, a good CEO knows what's going on in the shops. It's not a new principle. They've been talking about that for a while. But as a model and a principle and an approach, it's not quite been talked about like that. But it's always been true that if you work in a bigger organization in a bigger complex system, you don't want to run, measure, and tell the story internally in an abstract level. You want to try to stay as close to reality as possible. Mm -hmm. Often that means you have so many insights and data to collect. It's really, really hard. However, now we're living in a digital era. We have a lot of tools. You can actually track it much, much better. Mm -hmm. So it's not feasible to collect all this data siphon it, filter it, and make more sense of it. Yeah. And the bottom line is this. If there's one sentence towards how to be better at it, stay close to reality. Yeah, I love that. Stay close to reality. And and, and I'm going to actually throw a, a an addition to that, if I may, which is stay close to actuality because mm -hmm. reality and actuality are very different things. You know, and uh, and and, and a, a reality is ultimately someone's perception of a situation, whereas the actual we we can all get caught up in our own reality from time to time, and realize that what we think is the case isn't really the case, but it's just our perception, which is based on a whole bunch of past beliefs and experiences and all the rest of it that can alter that. So it's seeing things for what they actually are, not what we think that they are. I love that. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think. There's a thing that comes into play. It's like one is 
you know, if you look at it from a personal level, um, you might have seen this. And I mean, I've seen it here and there where people say, look, you know, when you're younger, middle ground age and you're older, you know, like when you're younger, everything that happens sort of, oh, that's the future. And you think about it that way. When you're middle, you go like, oh, it's just what it is. And I'm comfortable with that. And when you're older, you go, oh, that new stuff. Oh, I don't believe in that. I don't even want to touch it anymore, <laughs> you know? So you get a different perspective on literally what's going on and you tend to have a different op- opinion. And it's the same with companies. They look at stuff, the, the established stuff, it's in there. And then you have a bias internally to go like, oh yeah, but that's what we know. So we're more comfortable with it. So we kind of stick with that. The new stuff, mm. oh, we don't know. That's going to have a hard time to make it into a system and be considered because it's new. Mm. And I've been in plenty of companies where exactly this kind of, I think it's familiarity bias or yeah. maybe it's them, but differently. It's like, we are very happy to agree to something that we look at that we're familiar with. It's like, mm. yeah, yeah, that looks like the better idea. Not because it's the better idea. It's because that looks familiar. I'd yeah, rather go with that. And if it's unfamiliar, it's uncomfortable and you don't know what to think about it and you go, mm, I'm not sure, you know, and then you reject it. So systems often or groups of people often do exactly that, which just I, makes it really, which has always made it really hard for innovation to happen. I, I couldn't agree more, but but if there's lots of, there's so many sayings that are floating around in my head, you know, mm-hmm. if you don't grow, you die. You know, if you don't innovate, you evaporate. All of those things, they're so true mm-hmm. and better the devil you know than the devil you don't is a saying that a lot of people have and that's a mindset thing it comes back to mindset again whereas those that fall in love with innovation those that are willing to test new things try new things the compound effect of that is just phenomenal when it comes to creating change you know creating change fall in love with the idea of change rather than change being scary because things develop and um no that's that's really powerful so i'd love to know from you to to kind of finish up towards the the conversation of wicked problems today which i i mean you, i know that you, it's something you're extremely inspired by you could talk about for hours mm. and hours and hours marcus uh, what do you feel is the most important wicked problem of our lifetime right now that's a big question um i think you nearly sort of said it in some shape or form um, we have a lot of systems that are still pained by old-fashioned models that are come from the Industrial Revolution and a linear approach to things. So the biggest, wicked problem is that we haven't identified and acknowledged and embraced the idea of wicked problems exist and that we need a new approach. And I've seen this a lot in change and transformation. You know, a lot of organizations and societies um, countries they're still built on an older model that just doesn't work anymore we're not fit to react enough to these systems and i think maybe to some extent digital technology has contributed to the fact that we we affect things differently and things you know evolve and change more quickly maybe that's true i don't know um but the fact that we haven't really embraced a new approach to what's in front of us. That's the biggest problem. If we don't do that, if we don't do this iterative, de-risked problem solving, we will keep failing. And maybe if you look at these big problems like climate change, everything, we'll not make any ground on this unless we really change our approach. So that would be my thing. Change the approach, because I think we're starting to fail with the old approach. That would be my simplest thing i could think of yeah, which is a big big piece of work to do so look thank you so much mm-hmm. for, for coming on the show and, and discussing wicked problems for people that are, 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 are want to learn more about this learn more about you find out more where can they connect with you where can they learn more about wicked problems and, and the way that you work with people on them well uh you can either google wicked problems or you can contact me on linkedin i'm there so just say hello uh that's sort of the main key points i guess you know the other thing is uh, i'm trying to you know did my first book have a look at the book read it maybe review it in a positive way if you like it <laughs> and i'm writing a second one it's all around teams that kind of uh the, the second book is about teams better enabling how to deal with quick problems as well they're more practical uh that should be out in a month or two 
uh, yeah, say hi, otherwise Google it. It's, uh, it's a fascinating subject matter and it seems to be growing. Since the pandemic definitely is because, you know, pandemics are big problems. When I released the first book, it was pre-pandemic. I was like, no one's got interested in wicked problems. And then the pandemic happened. It was like, that's horrible. Mm. Oh, but hey, someone's talking about wicked problems now because pandemics are. Uh, so do that. There is, it's still niche in a small area, but there's a lot of other thought leaders who started to really look at this and go, hey, we need to change this. And mm. there's a lot of interesting conversations that have been starting a few years ago about this to rejuvenate new approaches to that. So say hi, Google it. There's not one place because it's a wicked problem. It's some of the centralized thing anyway. Sounds good. Well, for those of you that have been listening to this and uh, you're maybe thinking, oh, I've thought of a wicked problem. My, my, my challenge to you, I'm going to put to you, what's a wicked problem that you can think of? And I would love for you to come and share it. So we've got a Facebook group called the Make It Happen Community on Facebook. So if you've been listening to this and you've thought of a wicked problem, a wicked problem in your own life, a wicked problem that you see in society, culturally, socially, whatever it might be, come and share in the group, share a, a wicked problem that you can uh, that you can think of and maybe start a, a bit of a discussion about by posting that in the group. So Marcus, thanks again for coming and joining us. For everybody that's been listening, until next time, make it happen. Thank you for listening to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share it with anybody that you think could benefit from it. And also make sure that you hit subscribe so that you get to get the new episodes as soon as they're released.